after 11 o'clock in Seattle, where I am, and a little bit after 2 o'clock if you're on the East Coast. My name is Barry Luke. I'm the Deputy Executive Director of the National Public Safety Telecommunications Council, and today we are sponsoring a town hall presentation on data casting for public safety. Uh, it's going to be a wonderful panel presentation, and a lot of really interesting information uh, will be presented here. We are using a screen share uh, feature, so hopefully you're able to join us online and see the slides as we go through them. These slides are also available on the NIPSTIC website. If you're unable to connect to the screen uh, due to a security setting or other issue, you can go to our website, nipstick.org, npstc.org, and uh, there is a link there announcing this town hall session, and the slide deck is available there. The screen share link is also available in that um, online notice as well if you did not have that. I'm going to make a couple of just quick introductory uh, announcements before we kick off today. Um, first of all, please, uh, please mute your line uh, to prevent background noise. We have the ability here to, uh, to mute you or, or knock you off the bridge, but we'd prefer that you mute yourself. If you have music on hold, um, please don't put us on hold for the same reason. Uh, finally, uh, if you're using the Join Me screen share, you'll see that there's a chat function there, and we ask you not to use that chat bubble to send messages. We prefer that you send them to us in email, uh, and the email address is at the bottom of this slide, support at nipstick.org. We will be managing all the questions for the panel at the end of the presentation. Um, we will not be taking questions during the presentation in order to keep us on time. And with a large audience, which we have today, it's very hard to take questions uh, live from the audience over the phone. So if you have questions, uh, please submit them uh, to support, S-U-P-P-O-R-T, at nipstick.org. And please feel free to do that throughout the presentation. You don't need to wait until the end uh, to do that. And again, I'm going to... Now I'm going to go in and introduce our panel members uh, so you'll know who will be speaking with you today uh, right as we kick off the presentation. Uh, and these are in the order that they will be speaking to us. We have Patrick Butler, the president and CEO of APTS, America's Public Television Stations. And Pat will be speaking to us about data casting and the relationship of America's public TV stations with public safety. Craig Fugate, a uh, former administrator for FEMA, uh, who also has many, many other titles, uh, in addition to also being an APTS board trustee, and Craig will be speaking with us about the disaster perspective. Mark O'Brien uh, is the president and CTO of Spectra Rep, and Mark is the uh, technology uh, guy behind data casting, and he will be explaining uh, how data casting technology works. John Contestable is a program manager at the John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. Uh, John has done a lot of work with the DHS uh, Science and Technology Directorate looking at uh, video and data and a number of different applications and ways for first responders to share and exchange information, and he'll be sharing his perspective. We also have Sheriff Shane Reckwick, uh, retired sheriff from Adams County, Indiana. Uh, Sheriff Reckwick will be talking about their implementation of data casting and what they did to enhance school security. Ready? District Chief Jeff Cook is with us today, and uh, Jeff is with the Houston Fire Department, and he'll be speaking about how the city of Houston and Houston Fire and Houston Police used the data casting solution during some planned and unplanned events. And finally, we have Lana Thompson, the Executive Vice President and Chief Operations Officer for APTS, and Lana will be giving us the perspective on some things that have been happening with data casting. Hang on just a minute. Has been happening with data casting, including an announcement by the state of Tennessee uh, on some efforts that they're doing there to improve their ability to communicate in large-scale incidents. So at this time, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Pat Butler and uh, let Pat do some introductory comments for us. Pat? Okay. Thank you, uh, Barry. I appreciate it. And welcome, welcome everybody. Uh, America's Public Television Stations, as Barry suggested, uh, represents the 350 public television stations that operate around the country. Uh, in addition to the great broadcast programming that you all know, 
Uh, our stations provide mission-driven uh, public services to their communities in public safety, education, and civic leadership. Through our digital broadcast spectrum, many of our stations assist their public safety communities with encrypted data casting that delivers large files, blueprints, audio, and video to public safety officials on a secure basis. Public safety can offer robust spectrum, hardened towers, reliable infrastructure, uh, full-time engineering staffs, and high-powered broadcast transmitters to the mission of public safety. Our public television stations serve 50 states and six territories, and we serve 97% of the population of the United States and, and, and its territories. The next slide, please. <clears throat> we know that rural coverage is often a problem for mobile wireless carriers, but as you can see from this map, it's not a problem for us. We have a mandate of universal service, and with nearly 600 translators supplementing our 300 tele 350 television transmitters, we serve even the most remote areas of the United States. Next slide, please. In October of 2016, apps participated. So, we'll now. Oh. Can you just call it? In October of 2016, APPS partnered with the Science and Technology Directorate of the Department of Homeland Security here in Washington. Together, we are committed to improving the speed, effectiveness, and safety of our first responders and the people of our country. With data casting over our airwaves, our stations have demonstrated their effectiveness with firefighters sharing drone video, emergency managers sharing helicopter flood video, police and multiple overlapping jurisdictions ensuring crowd safety at large-scale events, and early earthquake warnings transmitting uh, those warnings in under three seconds uh, as opposed to the previous uh, standard of 30 seconds, and school safety with first responders receiving school blueprints and live video and saving life-saving time. The use cases are unlimited, and our stations can assist with secured information to responders as well as open alerts to the public. So that's a, a basic primer in what we're going to be talking about today with public television broadcasting, and it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, someone who knows more about emergency management than anybody else in America. He's been head of the Federal Emergency Management Administration for eight years under President Obama. He was head of the Florida Emergency Management Administration for eight years under Governor Jeb Bush. He's the veteran of hundreds of public safety emergencies, and I'm proud to say he's now a member of the Board of Trustees of America's Public Television Stations, the Honorable Craig Fugate. Craig? <coughs> Thanks, Pat. Not sure how honorable I am, and Barry will know more about that. <laughs> Barry and I go all the way back to when I started out as an EMT and he was a paramedic in Alaska County, Florida. Um, you know, from the standpoint of disasters and the use case, why is this important? Just because we have a capability doesn't mean it's necessarily uh, something we need to do. But let's look in the last couple of years, uh, some of the failures that we've seen that uh, public television data casting can address. Uh, if we go back to the California wildfires, uh, back to the fires even a year ago in Napa, I was talking to uh, uh, the state director of OES, Cal OES, Mark Delaguchi, and one of the things Mark pointed out was in those fires, they lost over 200 different cell sites. So for vast areas, uh, what many people uh, have defaulted to is their cell phone as their primary communication device was totally useless in getting information, uh, getting, getting the word out. Even uh, a lot of the tools that uh, people have built around uh, automatic calling systems or register systems or their apps, all that was failing. At the same time, the responders were rolling into these areas, uh, and they were limited to just their analog uh, radio channels. They couldn't get information. Uh, they couldn't transmit information. And again, in public safety, we, we adopt technology in many cases ad hoc. It says we increasingly have become dependent upon our cellular devices, our iPads, and other things being able to connect to the networks. Uh, that's really given us tools we've never had before. But it rides on the back of a system that turns out to be extremely vulnerable in a crisis. Uh, most recently this past year in Hurricane Michael, uh, throughout the area that the Panhandle was impacted, all the way up in the southwestern Georgia, 
vast swaths of that area had no cellular communication, no landlines, no Wi-Fi, no broadband. Uh, the only signal that was reaching most of those areas was PBS stations. And so this idea that a system that was built to reach areas that in many places of this country are rural are not served with robust broadband networks, oftentimes just daily have challenges to getting information. And even working from the field, once you get away from main areas, highways, cellular signal is, is, is at best iffy and data is, is just dismal. And so when the high-definition television standards were coming about and a lot of the work was being done on that repacking of frequencies, one of the things that was set aside was a certain amount of that spectrum for data casting. And when I talked to people, I said, think of this as one-way Internet. It's not a two-way communication system, but a lot of stuff that we could be putting into that signal and then transmitting out to the entire footprint of that signal across that entire area, literally bypassing failed infrastructure, failed communication networks. So at least responders are getting information. Uh, and so to me, this has really been intriguing as uh, you look at both the mission of public television stations and their role in the communities in serving the public and public safety, and this capability that in many cases I think we have underutilized or we don't even recognize its potentials. But as we continue to see widespread communication failures, widespread power outages knocking out a lot of this capability, communities and regions that have limited capacity on a good day, the fact that PBS stations – and their footprint and their signal and the fact that, again, the many hurricanes I went through in Florida, uh, the one thing we generally knew was going to be up and running were PBS stations. Uh, they serve already as the current backbone of the emergency alert systems and uh, backbone for getting the signal out on the wireless emergency alerts to the cellular networks. Uh, they, again, provide this tremendous capacity, and I think because – so much of what we have done, in many cases, has looked at other systems that uh, they work when they work, but when they fail, they, they leave us with nothing. This ability to data cast, I think, is our, our next big step And how do we get information to the people in the field, the right information at the right time, and not be constrained by our limitations in either cellular data or in our limitations to the existing uh, 800 megahertz or other uh, systems that are out there including FirstNet. Uh, you know, as, we, as these systems are coming online, it's going to prove things, but they are still vulnerable to failures and catastrophic disasters. PBS stations give us that ability to bridge those gaps. But more importantly, it gives us another avenue of pushing out large quantities of high bandwidth data that isn't really practical uh, today. And it's something that is right now available in all of our communities. But part of it is the use case. Part of it is, as you're going to hear later in this presentation, examples. But more importantly is getting the public safety community to understand there's a capability here. Uh, America's public television stations, your local PBS stations want to work with you. And that uh, this is something that it's already out there. This is not something we'll have to wait years to build. This is something that is ready to go now. It's really about building relationships and using existing technology to take advantage of this data casting capabilities. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Barry. Craig, thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, I think, you know, one of the key things is that uh, public safety agencies are facing uh, a whole new type of emergency event. And our emergency events are much more complex than they have been in prior years. And I think they're causing us to examine all the tools that we have and all the communications and notification systems that we have. And as you said, the California wildland fires were certainly uh, one of several examples that have occurred recently that have really challenged first responders and public safety agencies to both communicate with their people and, and with the public. Next, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Mark O'Brien. Mark O'Brien is uh, with us, and he is the President and CTO of Spectra Rep. And uh, Mark, take thanks, it away. Barry. Great. Let me uh, let me start out uh, by telling you. I'm going to tell you what this is, but let me start out by telling you what it's not. When when people who are not familiar with data casting hear about working with your public TV station and 
partnering with your local public broadcaster, sometimes the, the thought is that you're going to run public service announcements or, or uh, get content over TV broadcasts into TVs in people's homes. That's actually not what we're talking about here. What we are talking about here is partnering with public television in a way that they actually open their kimono, as it were, and give you direct access to their broadcast spectrum. The, the powerful transmitters, the tall towers, the fiber interconnects, the full-time engineers, the generators, all of the things that go into making sure that television continues to operate good day and bad day and saying, bring your content in, whatever that might be. Proprietary content, content you don't want the public to see on their TV sets, helicopter video, drone video, building blueprints, secure communications, messaging within uh, agencies, sharing information between agencies, between police and fire uh, to improve interoperability. Basically, what I'm describing is a new wireless nationwide network with redundancy and resiliency that has a 50-year-plus uh, history of providing reliable service. And you can use that as, I like the way Craig described it, as a one-way Internet. So this is a data delivery system, and it uses licensed spectrum from the broadcasters in partnership with the broadcasters to allow you to use this infrastructure to deliver your content. Next. So what we're really talking about here is IP content, computer information being delivered over broadcast TV. So, so almost by definition, or certainly by, uh, by describing it as computer data, this is not going to TV sets. This goes to computers. This goes to laptops in police cars and command vehicles. Uh, this goes to uh, other uh, devices that are not uh, computers. You think of TV, and one of the benefits of TV is its broadcast, its ability to get content to a lot of people all at the same time, a send once, receive many model, if you will, and that's essentially what TV is. Well, public safety content can benefit from that exact same model of send once, receive many. So for public alerting, which is a component of what we're talking about here, content that does go to the public, uh, there's no better means than a send it once, receive it everywhere at the same time broadcast model for that. But there are other use cases, and we'll get into some of them uh, in more detail here in just a couple of minutes, where your ability to share bandwidth intensive content, video for example, helicopter or drone video in particular, there may have been times for uh, folks in public safety who are, who are listening to this who, who may say, well, well, when we use drones, when we turn on the cameras in the helicopters, uh, we can get that down to the ground to specific places, but if we're going to send it back out wirelessly, there are limitations. We can do that today over cellular. We can do that today over FirstNet, but the more people you send it to, the more bandwidth you use and potentially – uh, even congest your own systems to the point that you can't have more people connect. This is unlimited. Now, this doesn't replace cellular, and I'm not saying for a second that this is better in any way than what you're doing now. It has its unique capabilities, and the objective here is to leverage the unique strengths of the broadcast television model and add that into what you're doing now so that you get almost a one plus one equals three scenario where you get the great strengths that broadcast brings and you have the great strengths that LTE, FirstNet, LMR, and existing systems have. And when you put them together, you get this bigger thing, and that's what some of the presenters uh, after me, I think, are going to talk about in uh, a little bit more detail. Uh, so just to kind of wrap a bow around it here, this is encrypted. This is also targetable, meaning you can send content just to police, just to fire, to both police and fire, or just to one individual. Uh, and I'm going to show in a second here some, how that, some of that works. Uh, it, it, at the same time, is one to many. So whoever gets targeted, you have no limits on how many people do get targeted to receive this information. Everything is encrypted. It's hidden from the public unless you're doing public alerting, in which case, obviously, it's, uh, it's not encrypted. Uh, next, please. So 
I, we, I don't really have the ability to do a live demonstration in this uh, particular uh, venue, but I want to say, and I, I think we'll reinforce later, that if anyone is interested in drilling down and seeing real live capabilities, we'd be delighted to set up follow-up uh, individual conversations and, and uh, demonstrations to show you. But So here's just some screenshots just to get a sense. Basically, as with anything, garbage in, garbage out. So broadcasting is this amazing nationwide network with all of these great capabilities, but if you don't put content into it, it doesn't do any good. That, of course, applies to the broadcast TV model as well. Uh, so what, what uh, we've been working on with some of our public safety partners is the ability to attach to your video management systems, to your multi-camera systems, to your helicopter video, to the drone video. We have the ability to uh, turn on the camera in a cell phone, for example, and have that appear. So these snapshots, these thumbnails that I'm showing on the, on the slide right now are, are just examples of content that might be coming in from various locations. And each one, in fact, might be a window into a multi-camera system so that you end up in a command center, for example, able to have uh, uh, the ability to look into multiple uh, systems, multiple camera systems, and, and aggregate, if you will, content coming in from each of those places. Next. And again, I can't do a, uh, a live demo here, but just to get a quick screenshot, here's an example of how we can uh, populate a list of people who have the data casting receiver. Some of them may be groups. Send this to all police. Send this to all fire. Some of them may be individuals. Send this just to this fireman and these two police officers because we know they're at the scene. But uh, we've uh, tried to make this as point and shoot and, and, and simple as possible. Check the box, hit apply, and now, boom, they're watching whatever content you're pushing out over the broadcast uh, TV spectrum, uh, wherever they might be, at the incident scene, regardless of the status of other networks that they may be connected to at that time. Next. So you think of TV, and of course you think of video, and everything I've been talking about so far, the examples have been video, and of course that's a marriage made in heaven. TV and video are, are perfect in so many ways, uh, the, the one-to-many uh, broadcast ability, the, the infinite scalability, if you will, uh, the TV station's in-house video expertise. Boy, there's no better partner to go and talk to about how do we share video with lots of people than a TV station who knows how to do that better than anybody. Um, but I wanted to show on this slide is <clears throat> we're not limited to video. This is really any computer information. Picture of a missing child, uh, a blueprint for a building for a SWAT team who may be about to uh, enter uh, a situation in a building they're unfamiliar with, uh, a picture of a suspicious package that you want the bomb squad to see. Uh, where, whatever it might be, uh, if you can put it on a computer, it can be sent over the TV broadcast signals, uh, again, to an unlimited number of people who, who have the, the right receivers. And the, the, the mechanism behind this is Common Alerting Protocol, CAP, which many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with. And so while we're sending content to specific data cast receivers, what we're really broadcasting is CAP files that can theoretically be ingested into any CAP compliant uh, device. Uh, and so from a public alerting perspective, from as CAP becomes more uh, prevalent within public safety itself, uh, the underlying architecture, if you will, is uh, common alerting protocol messages being transmitted that can be displayed, uh, next please, as a, uh, a, a scroll message across the bottom of uh, your computer screen. So you're working on your computer and, and a message just pops up and scrolls across the bottom, uh, like this example saying, here's a picture of the missing child. Here's a, uh, a blueprint showing which doors are still locked and which ones are open. Here's a uh, aerial image uh, of the uh, fire break line, for example, or whatever it might be. Next. So every wireless network has strengths and weaknesses, and I've been obviously touting the strengths of broadcast television. Uh, it's not perfect, but no wireless network is. Today, one of our limitations is that this does take a special receiver. So it's a separate but equal system, if you will. It takes 
separate infrastructure, and a different antenna, a different receiver uh, to receive it. Uh, next. One of the things that is about to change, though, uh, and this is coming and, and funded by the broadcasters, not, not being driven by public safety, but just broadcasters in general, are now uh, recognizing that the, one of the uh, future ways that people want to consume content, and for a lot of millennials and younger people today, maybe as a primary source, is portable devices. And so there is an effort, a multi-year effort, that's been going on within the broadcast industry to get into those devices. And I'm showing here an example of a FirstNet device, uh, because we see this as completely compatible with FirstNet. We see this as the strengths of this separate uh, uh, spectrum, this spe separate license spectrum, uh, this one-to-many capability, rural coverage, uh, as we can integrate into these devices that you already use today and get away from a, uh, a separate receiver, uh, the, the, that benefits you and that benefits uh, everyone and keeps people safe. And uh, that is coming. Next, please. So what's coming is a complete reworking of how broadcast television works. Next. And you'll be hearing more about this completely unrelated to data casting, but as this next generation broadcast TV standard becomes more prevalent and comes to your market, uh, then the ability to get straight into the same devices you have today um, will we'll, uh, increase the, the ability to, for this to help um, get information to you wherever you are. And importantly, though, while this is coming, and I, I don't want to harp on the point that this is coming and, and leave you with the impression that you should wait for this to come, we're doing this now. We've been doing this for over a decade. This is a mature technology, and as you'll hear from some of the other presenters, it's being used today. It's being used very effectively. And there are things we can do today that no other network can do. And the point here really is that everything we can do today is just going to keep getting better as this technology moves forward. And we're very excited about what we're doing with current uh, partners and the possibilities uh, to, to work with uh, some of you who may not be familiar with this. Uh, and again, if you want more information, Lana is going to talk about how you can follow up with apps to get a uh, much deeper dive into the technology itself and, and how it works. Thanks, Barry. Great. Mark, thank you so much for that. I, I, I know personally uh, I'm, I'm a retired deputy fire chief from Orange County Fire in Florida. And uh, when I first heard about data casting, I was just not really sure uh, what it meant. And, and even after I learned a little bit about it, I was just still not really sure how uh, how I could use that uh, to support our agencies. And, and as you take the time to learn more about it, you really, uh, once you understand the underlying uh, technology, uh, you really start thinking of a lot of different ways uh, in which to leverage uh, these capabilities. Um, for uh, anyone who's worked a, a, a large, a very large scale incident or a, a national security level incident or a, a wildland fire, uh, you know that we publish incident action plans typically every 12 hours during an operational period, and, and some of those some of those files can be 15, 20, 30 pages thick with all these different attachments. And and how we push those uh, incident action plan files out to the people who need them and get them even beyond uh, the incident command post has always been problematic. And data casting represents a way to take that that incident action plan and push that out to anyone who needs it. And, and today, uh, some first responders don't get a copy of the IAP because we actually uh, restrict some of the distribution just based on, on limitations and our ability to distribute that. I would also say that uh, uh, we've talked about uh, using data casting to send information to, to mobile and portable devices to, to, your, to your smartphone or to the computer in your car. This is also an excellent solution um, to do alerting and distribution of information into facilities. And if you're looking for a way to make sure that in uh, following a tornado or hurricane that you can push uh, information and directions out to public safety agencies, to critical infrastructure entities like hospitals, utilities, transportation departments who all need to hear uh, a common message and a common set of directions uh, from the government, uh, data casting can also be used very effectively to push that information into those buildings and into those facilities.
who may have lost their uh, internet connectivity for email uh, due to power outages, due to uh, downed lines, cut fiber, and so on. But uh, again, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to John Contestable. And uh, John Contestable is a program manager at John Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. They've worked extensively with the Department of Homeland Security to, to look at this technology and also to help push this technology out into some different trials uh, to, to demonstrate its value. Uh, John? Thanks, Barry. Um, one thing I should mention, Barry, before I joined Johns Hopkins, I spent 30 years with the Maryland Department of Transportation, and in that capacity I had responsibility for emergency management and home and security activities. So, you know, I've kind of got a foot in both camps as um, I've been at – many, many scenes on scene for large incidents in particular. I've also been at the EOC. I was the DOT's rep to the Maryland Emergency Management Agency for 17 years. So uh, I, I kind of have some understanding of the public safety need and the emergency operations uh, activities, but now I'm with uh, Johns Hopkins in a, in a technologist role, if you will. So um, as you said, Barry, this is a great tool for particular use cases and particular needs. Um, you said it earlier that, you know, events seem to be coming more complex. And, you know, I think that's just a reflection of the fact that we have become much more interconnected. You know, we are connected to our supply chains, connect us to other entities. Um, we are in close proximity in urban areas to different things. Um, and so as a result, these events are more complex. It's, and so there's a need for more data. Uh, in order to have good situational awareness. And on top of that, there is more and more data becoming available every day. Um, with the Internet of Things, as devices are instrumented and we have more information, we're going to have things like body-worn camera footage, we're going to have license plate reader footage, we're going to have dash cameras, we're going to have sensors everywhere from chem bio detectors to weather stations to rad nuke detectors. I mean, and then Craig mentioned, you know, blueprints and rosters and material safety data sheets. I mean, the list goes on and on. And you want to put that in the hands of the people that need it. And it's not only the end user in the field, but it's also the people at the at the centers. And you said it just a minute ago. You've got emergency operations centers that have a need for data. Um, you've got incident action plans from the field that need to get back to headquarters. Um, you've got traffic operations center. Our chief cook's going to talk, and I know Transcom is in his backyard down in Houston. So you've got traffic operations centers. You've got um, call centers, obviously. You've got um, uh, 911 call centers and dispatch centers everywhere that need information. And as part of the next generation 911, you're going to see how do you bring information into the call center. So there's, there's an explosion of data, and our ability to move it to where it needs to be can be constrained. Either the capacity of those pipes can be limited or they may be vulnerable during disasters, as Craig said. You know, during a wildfire, they lost a lot of cellular towers. During an extended power outage, a lot of cellular um, towers are, are battery powered as backup. And if it exceeds the uh, certain so many hours, you know, those, those sites will go down. So, and, and, you know, it is what it is. That's not so much a criticism of the cellular network. It's just, it's just, it is what it is. As, as Mark O'Brien said, every transmission path, every set of pipes has its strengths and weaknesses. So um, we think that this uh, is, is a great tool to use as we move beyond land mobile radio. Um, obviously, video is becoming more prevalent, and, and um, FirstNet is going to help us with that, uh, obviously. And I've been associated with FirstNet almost since the beginning. Um, but on the other hand, we have issues with rural coverage and urban congestion are, are some things that would be a concern, even with FirstNet on the scene. So we kind of view this as, as an enhancement to FirstNet, that it could help with meeting the rural coverage mandate, um, could help with congestion relief. Um, basically, you're leveraging existing license spectrum that's already out there, that's already deployed, that's already in use, um, that's optimated, optimized for data and video in particular, and it's optimized for one-to-many delivery. So we'd like to bring that into the public safety world and leverage it. Um, next slide. Um, and, and for those that are on the call that say, you know, we're kind of taking a chance on a new technology here. Well, um, it, it, it's an emerging technology, but I don't know that I'd call it new. Uh, as Mark O'Brien said, this has been used in a number of places for going on 10 years now. 
Um, some of the places we've demonstrated data casting are listed on this slide. Um, and I do have to do a, give a shout out to DHS Science and Technology because they, they see this. They see this problem and they're focusing resources on trying to address it. So there's, um, DHS Science and Technology cares about this issue. Um, they have funded a number of demonstrations as shown here. I also need to do a shout out to the Office of Emergency Communications or Emergency Communications Division and the CISA organization. Uh, they're focusing on the movement of data for public safety. And of course, a shout out to USDOT, US The Next Generation 911 program. Um, they are all taking a look at how do we move data around, how do we move it efficiently, how do we get to get it to where it needs to go. But back to this slide, we've done demonstration projects in those cities, as you see there, um, and counties. Um, but there's actually a few more that, that aren't listed. We did a project um, in Grant County, Washington, in Salt Lake City, um, and it's already in use in uh, Las Vegas. So there are a good half a dozen or more places where we've done this. Each one of these demonstrations, did. there was a, a slightly different twist. Um, Chicago was one of the first demonstrations we did. Uh, we were there during the draft, uh, the, the NFL draft, which brought thousands and thousands of people to town. Um, in Boston, we did it in association with the Coast Guard. Interestingly, as the Coast Guard gets offshore, they lose, they, they're, they're, they're reliant upon uh, marine band radio. This gave them the capability to send data to the, to a, to a, uh, a ship at sea. Um, uh, in Houston, we're going to hear more about this from Chief Cook. We were there for the Super Bowl, supporting uh, his operations during the Super Bowl. We were there for the Houston Marathon. And in Indiana, you'll hear more from uh, Chief Reckwig about um, an active assailant uh, drill with a, with a high school. So all these reports can be found on uh, the DHS website, which the listing is shown at the bottom of this slide. So uh, without, without that, I'll turn it back uh, to the next speaker to talk about some of these um, projects. Great, John. Thank you very much for that. And uh, as you said, the, um, the, these slides are available on our website. I know some of you may be joining after I made those introductory comments, but you can go to the NIPSTIC website, npstc.org, and uh, the announcement for this town hall session is in the middle there, and you can click on that and download a set of these slides if you would like, and that may help you find some of these links a little easier than uh, trying to copy them down uh, as you see them on the screen here. Um, next, we're going to move into a different part of our presentation today, and we're actually going to hear from two public safety agencies who have worked with the data casting solution and have tried it uh, in different ways to achieve some different objectives. And uh, first, we're going to ask for uh, Sheriff Shane Reckwig uh, from Adams County, Indiana Sheriff's Department to talk to us about their experience with data casting and how they looked at that from a school security perspective. Uh, Sheriff Reckwig? Yeah. Well, thank you, Barry. Um, real quick, uh, you know, we're kind of uh, – we're a small county. We're about a little over 34,000 people in it. We have three school districts. Uh, we have school resource, resource officers in all three schools – and only the sheriff's office is responsible for one of those schools, and that was uh, Adams Central. And Adams Central uh, was a school that we uh, we uh, demonstrated the uh, data casting system in, and we really appreciate the uh, the work with the uh, Adams Central School District uh, uh, superintendents and and those folks in, in helping us out with this because we had a camera system that just was not working for us anymore, and this opportunity came along, which. Thank you for for the help with the uh, with uh, demonstrating this and kind of showing us the scalability of this thing. And what it, what it's really allowed us to do is connect multiple different you know multiple cameras into one system. We had uh, a drone flying, we had um, a body camera, we had our in in our in school uh, camera systems. And if, if given, we could probably even put our, um, our mobile cameras and our police cars into that system and be able to broadcast it not just to one person, but to thousands of people, which we didn't have a thousand people to broadcast it to, but we had no loss in speed or anything like that. You know, we were able to send messages and, and send video and send texts and diagrams across the data casting system that all our public safety personnel could see. And in fact, not only could we see it locally, but we were sending it down to the state DOC, which was uh, about 200 miles away. 
So the state DOC um, and their emergency operations center was actually watching what was going on without having to bother anybody about, you know, what what is going on in your school? What what type of situation are you having? They could actually see everything as it was unfolding. So they have better clarity of the type of incident that you're dealing with and any type of resources that you may need, then the state can prepare those resources to deploy to your to your location. If it's an active school situation, active shooter situation, or any type of situation that you may be having. Um, but this this thing, you know, when we started this project a little over a year ago, you know, it's kind of hard to imagine exactly, you know, what it would look like. And now that I've seen it firsthand, um, you know, it, it's not not a system that fits everyone's uh, needs, but it is a system that fits a lot of needs for a lot of people in a lot of ways that they they may not be able to fit those needs right now. And so if you can imagine, you know, every school district has a different type of camera system. And some public safety can get into those camera systems, and some public safety entities cannot. But what this system allows us to do is clear across the state or clear across the nation, be able to plug those camera systems into a system that everyone can view, and that everyone can view without sacrificing our other networks like our cellular network or our uh, LAN Internet uh, systems or our uh, fiber systems or anything like that. And, and not only one person can view it, but many people can view it. In fact, if given, we could probably even view what is happening in Indiana in another, another part of the state or another part of the country and be able to see exactly what's happening. And the one thing I really liked here is, you know, the, the issue that we've always had is, you know, how do you, how do you send out messages to, to a large group of people? Well, you know, a lot of times there's people making copies of stuff and that, that's not, that's not productive. You know, it's, it's not uh, time saving, but, you know, be able to broadcast information out to everybody and put it in their hands instantly. That's productive and that's, that's time saving. Um, some of the things that we kind of discovered, uh, in our, our situation is that, um, well, l l let me step back that, you know, all, all public safety in Adams County is on the same mobile data terminal system. Uh, the same records management system. We're all on the same radio system, the same L LMR system, uh, which gives us capabilities to, to communicate a little bit better. But the one thing that we did discover in this in this incident, we did like a dry run that morning, and we discovered that there, our M LMR system did fail, um, that we weren't really able to communicate, which during our break between our dry run and our actual uh, demonstration of the system, we were able to identify how to fix that. Now, I know that we're not unique to that. In other counties and other cities, municipalities have the same problem, you know, with, with our, uh, with their LMR systems and being able to continuously communicate. And usually, you know, when I go around and I hear people talk about what's their failures in most incidences, it's probably because of the radio system. The radio system fails to them, for them in some way. Even if our radio system would fail, the ability to be able to send messages out over a, an alternate system, even though it's not as good as maybe the, the LMR system that you have, it just gives you a, a, a different and maybe a, an alternate way of being able to communicate. And that's, that's the one thing that I've really seen about this. And the one thing that I, I, could, I could see in the future is the state of Indiana possibly, you know, having uh, the capabilities of having the devices at all the PBS stations and allowing those schools and public safety entities to build those those trusts and those agreements between them and be able to broadcast those the, their information over the PBS stations here in Indiana so that you know public safety can see this stuff. Um, you know, I starting on this about two years ago, I never really knew where it was going to go, but I can tell you right now, uh, it does. I'm impressed with it, and it fills in a, a gap that. Um, not a lot of other not a lot of other systems are able to fill in, um, and there are not very many public safety entities in Indiana that can say that they have a, a connection into the camera system in their schools. and And I really wonder if they do. Have they really tested it in in an exercise to see if you know how many users can they get on that system before they start losing uh, clarity in their video feeds 
or that the system slows down so much that it renders it almost almost useless. So um, that's just a little bit what I you know I wanted to kind of talk to you guys about. I, I think we we really we really learned a lot from it, and we're going to continue using the uh, the system that we have. And in fact, uh, as a demonstration, other under, other entities in Adams County has actually looked at it and are saying, "How do we get on? How how can we start using this?" And uh, some of the public uh, school systems are talking about it. Um, some of the uh, private school systems are talking about that weren't part of that exercise. And the hospital and some of our uh, other government entities that have critical infrastructure that they want to be able to share video ha have talked about it. And even us as a district, in, uh, District 3 in Indiana, um, the district has even talked about a little bit about um, that, the capabilities and maybe the, the uses for the, for the data casting. So, uh, Barry, thank you very much for having me on, and um, and I really appreciate it, and, and I, a lot of thumbs up for everyone who participated in our exercise and, and really helped us out in, in an area that I think that um, it really shows the benefit for us. Great. Sure, Frickley, thank you so much. And, uh, you know, one of the uh, – I just want to emphasize a point that you made early on, and that is the uh, the relationships that you had to have in order to make the project successful. And Many times we, we focus on technology and, and buying the black box, if you will, um, but the reality is for any of this technology to be successful, it requires that we have good, strong relationships with all the entities that we're working with and really ties into you know all, all the lanes of, of the SafeCom interoperability continuum of governance, policy, and procedure. Um, so I appreciate you mentioning the fact that you, you sat down with the officials in the schools and worked all this out. I'm sure there was a number of uh, privacy issues to be addressed, and, and every uh, use case has um, uh, different things that have to be considered about uh, about how to secure data and maintain data. But uh, thank you for your comments. Yep, thank you. Uh, next, we're going to ask uh, District Chief Jeff Cook from the Houston Fire Department to talk to us about uh, how uh, the city of Houston uh, has been using data casting for a number of different uh, a number of different types of situations. Um, Chief Cook, take it away. All right, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm going to kind of start off with a little bit of some examples kind of on how we utilize this. Um, but it's the data testing is basically another tool, you know, in the toolbox, only this one provides the end users, those in the field, with tools and abilities that we've never really had before. Uh, we have the ability to stream video from different sides of the building or different areas within the air, uh, within the city uh, back to the uh, emergency operations center or forward command post. And as, as the incident commander sitting in front of a, a burning structure, I really have to rely on verbal reports on what the conditions are. Um, when... When somebody says they have light smoke, uh, does that mean it's like light in color or it's rising because it's lighter than air or there's not much of it? But there's a little bit of confusion sometimes when you're just relying on verbal cues like that. Uh, now that we have the ability to kind of send uh, streaming cell phone video back to the you know to the incident commander. I don't I don't have to worry about what he meant by light smoke or what he meant by whatever it was he was trying to say because I can see real time video from the other side of the building. Um, it kind of fills uh, a lot of the gaps out because you know a picture is always worth way more than than you know the words. Um, we can send video from the field back to the emergency operations center during uh during the super bowl uh for instance there was a major accident at one of the major intersections right around the super bowl uh or right around the venue and there were reports initially on the radio that it was going to be a fatality and we were going to have to have that that incident uh, that whole intersection shut down for you know a long time during this, uh, right around the time the game was ending. And we were able to send one of our units over there, have him stream video back 
we were able to get a lot of uh, real-time data from the scene that proved that it wasn't a fatality and it was going to be able to get cleared a lot faster. And we were able to kind of, on the fly, uh, make command decisions uh, just based on the, the videos that we're getting back and the reports that go with them. Um, you know, the conditions, we've unfortunately had several floods in our area over the last several years. Uh, and some of the technology as far as the rising water and things like that don't always match kind of what we're thinking. So our definition of water at the top of the bank, for instance, or over the bank may not necessarily mean the same. So we, we can send crews out or we can have crews that are outside, you know, in the areas actually stream video back to the emergency operations center and we can see real time conditions of you know, flood conditions, um, all that type of stuff. Uh, in fact, after Hurricane Harvey, uh, we were going to send one of our chiefs out with the uh, police officer's helicopter, and they were going to stream video back with the uh, helicopter camera, the downlink system that we had. Uh, the only problem was they brought a, a helicopter that didn't actually have a camera attached. And so... Our assistant chief just basically stuck his cell phone out the window of the helicopter and flew over the city, all around the city, and streamed beautiful images straight back to us at the uh, command center, and we were able to see conditions all over the city. Uh, so the technology really helps, I mean, a ton. Uh, we're able to send, you know, video from the scene to the specialty units that respond uh, where we have... Uh, Hazardous material teams coming in because I think every it seems every gas leak we have in the city is a two inch main until somebody actually gets there and and that it's a little bit different you know conditions uh, with the port of Houston it seems like we have people that you know get workers that get trapped in uh, cargo holds and things periodically and we can stream video back to the responding rescue units or hazmat crews that allow them to see what equipment and what conditions they're facing before they actually arrive on scene. Uh, it, it gives us the ability to kind of send the data and the information we need to those of us who actually need it, whether it's safety data sheets or weather radar or floor plans or anything that we can see on a screen, we can send it out to the field uh, and we can target it for specific users, uh, and those alerts uh, that that uh, Mark had mentioned, being able to send targeted alerts or emergency messages to different people, uh, so there's an active shooter or the shooter's moving your direction or, you know, the wind conditions have changed and that area is now a shelter-in-place area or anything, anything that's important that we need to get it to them. We have that ability, uh, and we've used it, you know, quite a bit. Uh, I mean, you can probably switch slides, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about planned and unplanned events. <clears throat> or maybe mine's not switching with you. I'm not sure, but... Uh, Jeff, my, mine is updated here to show both the planned and unplanned. There we go. Okay, mine was a little slow there. I thought I got lost. So planned and unplanned, it's not, I mean, it's not real difficult to uh, kind of talk about. Uh, planned events are those that we knew were coming. And in Houston, we I think we may be the only city uh, in America that's actually hosted a Super Bowl and a World Series and a major hurricane all in the same year. <clears throat> I'm not so sure that Harvey we really wanted to host, but it came. Uh, that being said, that gave us a lot of opportunity to play with different technology and learn different things and see how to kind of use it. And and the the first hand benefits that we found with data casting is just amazing. I mean, because like I said, it, it provides us with the opportunity to use things or to see things that we've never really had. Uh, the ability to see before. Uh, it's the unplanned events that we still have a little bit of struggle with because 
you know, technology sometimes is hard to get, you know, user buy-in, uh, especially in the fire service. Change is always difficult. Uh, but the way that we've kind of been able to set some of this up, it's, it's almost so user friendly that, you know, it's almost fireman proof. You push the big red button and you're streaming video and you push the big red button and you're not streaming video. And so we're getting better on a lot of the unplanned events. Uh, those hazmat scenes or those large fires or those other, you know, weather events and different things, uh, that we're st starting to really see a little bit more of a benefit. And someone mentioned drones earlier, and we still have a a ways to go in our drone program, uh, but we do virtually every time that, that drone goes in the air, we utilize data casting to send it back uh, because it's the only tool that we've found that works uh, as well on the fly as anything else that's out there. And, and it really accomplishes a lot. Um, if if you kind of flip over, we'll we'll talk about the the other jurisdictions and the the multidiscipline tool part for for a second. Um, again, because we've we've had the Super Bowl and World Series, and we had the largest world's largest rodeo, which is kind of like a Super Bowl, only it's a month long, uh, where there's you know. 100,000 people at the, at the venue every day. Uh, the biggest difference with the rodeo and where it kind of ties in is the majority of the people that are out there working are volunteers, and they're volunteers from multi-different agencies, multi-different disciplines, uh, all walks of life. And so we've some of ours, like I'm, I'm a member of the safety committee that we do all the first aid and all the safety kind of items. Uh, we're starting to try and utilize it a lot more, and we have people from other agencies and other counties. Uh, we're a UASI region, and we also have a, basically a 13-county region that share technology and data and, and different things together. And so we've been able to kind of start working on things in our real jobs that also help on, like, like I said, the rodeo, because you've got people from all these different counties that come in there and go, oh, yeah, I know how to use that because we, we did it in our, in our particular area or we were able to do it when we were working with the Super Bowl or whatever it happened to be. Uh, and the targeting aspect and the, the ability to be able to send specific targeted data to specific users is something that the law enforcement side really really likes down here. Uh, in Houston, we have some issues between, you know, police and fire sometimes, and they feel like the security of that is, is so much better than just sending it out to anyone that it really has kind of helped us mend and bridge some of those gaps. And so we've really been able to work together on a lot of this. Uh, and really through Super Bowl, World Series, the Final Four the year before, you know, the marathons we have every year. Uh, and we've been able to kind of all work together and share and and use it and see how it benefits us, how we can uh, provide information to the other jurisdictions and the other agencies. Uh, we do floor plans and, and walkthroughs and pre-plans for fire incidents that happen to be kind of the same exact information that a SWAT team needs if they're going to go uh, try and attack a building. They attack it the same way the firefighters attack it. Uh, so we can share our floor plans with them and things like that. So it's it's really kind of helped bridge the gap in a lot of different areas. Um, and it's really, it's really just done a lot of not just the data, but just the personal relationships and the the interagency, uh, the interoperability, I suppose, because we all kind of work together a lot more because of, of technology like this that, that we've been able to, to test and vet and work on together. Uh, we 
I think John mentioned earlier we were testing the system during the marathon several years ago before the 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 Super Bowl and one of the things that we wanted to do is actually try and break it. We wanted to really overload it and bust it because we we wanted to fail it right then if we could and we were very unsuccessful. Uh I had over over 17 different video streams from all around the uh the marathon all streaming in there with virtually no impact at all on any of the feeds the 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 video clarity, the speed of it, everything worked perfect and we were we were almost disappointed that we couldn't break it. Uh that being said, we all were very excited about what it kind of has has been able to provide and it and it, you know, we can't say enough about it because it's that tool that kind of bridges the gap for us. Uh we have multiple tools. I know we've talked about school cameras and portable cameras and different things, and we have cell phones. Uh, we have a public safety video network. Uh, we have several different web-based kind of applications. Uh, every one of them, we kind of can use the data casting system to send whatever it is we need directly directly to those units that need it. So it's it's really been able to kind of provide us with that tool that that really kind of encompasses all our, of our other tools. I hope that kind of makes sense, and I'm sorry if I was rushing through it a lot, but I, I kind of had a lot to say there. No, Chief Cook, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, for our audience, if you have an opportunity uh, through the trade press or, or another uh, ability to just follow what uh, what Houston is doing from a public safety perspective, is really very transformational. Um, uh, Houston and the Harris County area were one of the early adopter cities for FirstNet with public safety broadband, and as a result of that work, they have some very robust um, cell phone-based applications that are in use by many public safety agencies that also allow sharing of data that, that further supplement uh, the capabilities of the data casting network. Chief Cook made a, a, a very important point I want to emphasize, and that is the uh, as, as you look at these uh, more complex incidents, especially in a large city like Houston, uh, what you find, and, and everyone who works for public safety appreciates this, uh, uh, what you find is that more and more layers of the chain of command want to know what is happening. And, and, and they want to, sometimes they listen to the radio, um, but the ability for data casting to take that streaming video from that firefighter who's in front of a warehouse fire, and not only for the, uh, for the responding battalion chief or district chief to hear that verbal report of, of the fire conditions at that warehouse, for that uh, district chief to see a video clip of, of, of the extent of that fire, but also to extend that video back into the communication center and back into other facilities at Houston Fire and other agencies, um, uh, especially as Jeff talked about the Super Bowl and the World Series. Uh, you have all sorts of chiefs and deputy chiefs and assistant chiefs who all want to know exactly what is happening because they're in this decision-making process. And uh, an incident occurring on one side of the city of Houston that's going to demand a lot of resources is going to impact the ability uh, of other parts of the city of Houston. And so many of these resource deployment decisions are, are very strategic in, in how they're carried out. And video really helps all of those players make better decisions and better informed decisions. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention is uh, also related to sort of video and video sharing. Uh, the city, uh, Houston Police, uh, leverages a lot of the public safety camera system that's in place. Uh, and Houston Police officers who are working with the communication center can uh, look at an incident that's just been dispatched for a, a purse snatch, and they can see that the 911 operator typed in a, a description of the suspect and that, that officer can go find the cameras in the area of, of that purse snatching, and they can actually rewind the video back in time, and they can search for a, a six-foot white male wearing a red shirt, and they can find that suspect uh, performing the purse snatch, and then they can actually follow that suspect and guide the officers. So 
Uh, all that is done today because that video is coming into a centralized location and is uh, and they're relaying this information uh, by radio. But data casting also provides uh, additional capabilities to push some of that stuff out to some of the officers and detectives who are on the scene. So if you have an opportunity to uh, to read more about uh, what Houston is doing, I, I would encourage you to do that. And again, uh, Chief Cook, thank you very much uh, for your comments today. There's my pleasure. Thanks. Uh, next, I'm going to turn it over to Lana Thompson. She's the Executive Vice President and the Chief Operations Officer at America's Public Television Stations. And Lana's going to talk uh, first about what's happening with the state of Tennessee and then also uh, some more general comments about how data casting, how you can learn more about data casting and how you can uh, actually look at uh, contacting your local public TV station. Lana? Great. Thanks so much, Barry. I want to first talk about um, a recent uh, grant that established our first statewide data cast system. And this was done in late September 2018 um, through then Governor uh, Haslam of Tennessee. Um, and what provoked uh, the governor's action was the uh, mountain fires, um, the Gatlinburg Mountain Fires, Great Smoky Mountains, um, where many, many cell towers went down and many firefighters lost their lives. And um, through the good work of our six Tennessee stations, our six public TV stations in Tennessee, a couple of whom are on the call with us today, um, they were able to explain to the Department of Safety and Homeland Security in Tennessee what public television can offer and how it can help avoid that situation occurring in the future. Uh, a lot of hard work was done, and it resulted in a $2 million grant um, from the Department of Safety and Homeland Security in Tennessee to our six Tennessee public TV stations. And the grant is to deliver private, secure communications between first responders and back to their management team for police, fire, medical, and government personnel. Um, this grant covers not only the purchase of data cast equipment and software, which I will say is all on-the-shelf equipment um, and actually relatively inexpensive to compare to much communications equipment today. Um, but it's existing on the shelf. It covers the cost of that. It also covers training um, for first responders and other personnel and ongoing operating costs and um, and work along those lines. There's a 30-month uh, timeline to put it in, although the first pilots will occur uh, within the six months of the grant, so very short time frame. Um, we're very excited because it, it sh it's a great example. We hope it can be used as a model in other states, but it shows how our public TV stations within a state are interconnected. All of our stations across the United States are interconnected, um, but, um, but within a state, they're interconnected. They have hardened towers. They have auxiliary generators. They have secure communications. They're resilient. Um, you know, our networks don't go down uh, in, in cases of of fires or floods or other um, natural disasters. Um, so we're really hoping this will um, become a model for other states to deploy. I will just mention one other state that's working diligently on doing the same, um, and it's, been, it's being done in two phases, and that's the state of California. The California Governor's Office of Emergency Services uh, awarded a grant uh, to APTS to uh, build out data casting equipment and, um, and software developments and that sort of thing in five of our stations in California for early earthquake warning. Um, Patrick Butler mentioned in his opening comments that the live tests were actually done in less than three seconds. Um, and so now with phase two, we'll build out the rest of the California stations. So we're really, really encouraged that the words getting out to the public safety community, to state legislators, to state governor's offices, um, that we have answers and we want to be part of the solution uh, for the public safety community. Next slide, please. Uh, we heard some great information today from, from uh, all of our speakers, and 
and I just I just want to reiterate a couple points and then leave you with a couple asks, if I may. Uh, first of all, you, you saw and heard the n numerous use cases here, fires, floods, crowd control, school safety, search and rescue, over-the-water exercises with Coke scars. We're doing enhanced 911 responsiveness testing in North Carolina. All of these have in common that we are providing first responders um, with rich data, video files. Um, I loved... Uh, when Jeff Cook said he tried to bust it and couldn't. Um, you know, we're one to many. That's what we do. We don't overload. We're in very rural areas. We serve, we have a universal service mandate statutory that we take seriously. Uh, we serve almost 97% of the population of this country. Uh, no area is too remote for us to be. So we're solution for rural areas. And the key is that we're providing interoperability. It isn't two-way, but it certainly allows uh, multiple jurisdictions, uh, multiple public safety agencies to share the same video, the same files, the same blueprints of buildings all at the same time. So it is a form of interoperability. And as, as we advance with FirstNet or other, um, uh, other telecommunication systems, we're completely interoperable with them as well. Um, so now the ask, if I may leave you with this. First of all, we would love to hear from you. Um, please, if, you know, if you're interested in, in talking to your local public television station or setting up a live demo for some people back in your offices, we're more than happy to do that. Um, you can reach me, my uh, email, lthompson at apts.org. Um, my phone number's there, our website's uh, easily accessible. Um, we really would like to be the conduit um, between public safety, local public safety, and local public television stations. So please, please feel free to reach out and, and contact me or other speakers on the call today. Um, and the second two are: how, how are we going to advance these uses and get the funding uh, and move this forward? Um, and that is talk, talk about this, if you will. If, if you think this would be helpful, talk about it with your management team. Um, I think we can help and we can push forward um, state uh, and, and regional solutions to this. It's working. It worked in Tennessee. It's working in California. It's working in other areas. Um, but we need to partner with you to do that. Um, and then the last ask is, as you look at other systems like FirstNet, keep in mind that we are completely complementary. A um, number of these tests included use of Band 14, uh, and we're completely complementary. So make sure you keep that in mind if, if you talk with FirstNet, the FirstNet team or others. Um, we, we just want to be part of the solution. Um, you know, we're, we're – um, Non-commercial educational television, and the concept of education and information is is broad, and and I think this is is uh, some critical education and information that we can share with some of the most important people in this country, and that's our uh, public safety first responders, uh, and uh, and this similarly can be served with the public at large. Um, as we go down the line uh, and, and receivers are, are deployed. So I, I think the uses are unlimited. And um, thank you, Barry and Nipstick, for this opportunity to present today. And uh, we'd love to hear from all of you. And thanks again. Great, Lana. Thank you so much for that. Um, and we have, uh, I, I was just going to remind everybody, if you have questions, you can send them to us, support at nipstick.org. But I, actually, we've already received quite, quite a few who have come in uh, during the presentation. Um, as Lana mentioned, uh, please feel free to reach out to her or, or any of the panel members if you have questions. Uh, this slide deck is available on the Nipstick website, so you can easily access everyone's contact information uh, through the slide deck there. I wanted to start with uh, a few questions that – um, we had obtained while the session was going on, and Lana, the, the first one might be a good one for you or, or, or for, for Pat. Uh, 
about why public television stations are willing to share their spectrum uh, with public safety. There's, there's been some advances in the technology that, that allow that to happen, but just uh, what makes the public television station say, hey, we, we should go do this? Right. Well, uh, Barry, this, this is Pat, and l let me just say that uh, the public safety is one of our three uh, uh, pillars of public service, as we call them here, uh, along with education and civic leadership. And so uh, we, we've been in the public safety business for quite a long time through the, uh, the WEA program at the federal level, and, and as uh, Craig Fugate said a few minutes ago, providing the, 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 the backbone for that uh, for that service, and and in in the last several years, we've been we've been branching out from that to do more and more uh, local service, and uh, as, uh, as as Chief Cook was was saying, and uh, we we've also developed this this great relationship with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, uh, and uh, so we, we're we're able to demonstrate these various compelling use cases all over the country. Um, we, we just think of this as part of our DNA. We're, we're, we're a little different than our commercial uh, broadcasting friends uh, who, who are who are in, in a substantially different business than we're in. We're, we're in the public service business, and that's what we're obliged to do by the uh, by the FCC and by the terms of our licenses. And we found that uh, the, the the better technology gets, uh, the the more uh, we are able to, to serve, and, and the more a more effectively we're able to serve. Uh, both the, uh, the both the, the, the viewers in our in our traditional audiences and the more specialized audiences in, in the public safety community. So uh, th this is something we're in for the long haul. We've been in it for a very long time already, and we're looking forward to a very uh, a robust future uh, in, in public safety going forward. And, and we, we we'd be delighted to work with with any of you or all of you in uh, in, in making that future uh, come to pass. Great, Pat. Thank you. Um, uh, we've had several questions that have come in uh, about uh, the difference between data casting and what an agency may do on FirstNet or, or, or with another type of cellular carrier. And I know John Contessa, but you started to speak about this a little bit in your presentation. Could you offer a few more comments about some of the differences between uh, whether a first responder agency uses Verizon today or they're signed up for the new enhanced FirstNet service? Yeah. Um, thank you, Barry. Uh, it's been said before, but let's hone in on that a bit, that data casting is really a broadcast technology. It's a one-way technology from a source distributed to many, and that's really one of the strengths of data casting. But as Chief Cook said, you're going to have to get video into the system, so to speak. So data casting can only push what it's fed. We think it complements FirstNet or commercial cellular service, if it were so on Verizon as another example, because when you're getting seen footage from a cell phone, as, as, as both uh, uh, Chief Reckwig and, and Cook said, that has to be uploaded somehow. That has to come from the scene and get pushed up, if you will. And often that is across commercial wireless systems or in the future could be first that. But distributing the video from that once it's, once it's pushed up, Distributing the video makes more sense across data casting if it's going to multiple people. Um, technologically, without getting too deep in the weeds, cellular technology uses unicast, so it pushes it pushes it one at a time to the various end users. Whereas TV is natively uh, broadcast, which makes it a much more efficient medium. Uh, to think of it in terms of your television station. You know, it doesn't matter if there's two TV sets out there or a million TV sets out there. It's going out over the air, and as long as you've got a receiver, you can get it. And it doesn't congest like a cellular unicast system might. And, again, that's not so much a criticism of uh, the commercial carriers as it is. It's just one of the limitations of that technology. Um, and so uh, you, the vision is that you would upload video from the field one time, perhaps over commercial network or first net, but then you would make use of the strengths of data casting to distribute it broadly and widely um, to end users or to other operation centers, as you said. So that's kind of how we think these two things are complementary, You're using the strengths of each of the systems to most maximum effectiveness. Great, John. Thank you so much. And uh, a question I guess I'll, I'll first uh, ask uh, to Chief Cook and then to Sheriff Rickwood. How hard was it uh, to get this solution set up? For, first in Houston, Chief Cook, was it 
Did it take a long time? Was it? Was it? You mentioned the firefighters found it pretty easy to use. Right. I mean, the 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 setup is is really pretty simple. Um, I mean, once all the technology that I'm not real familiar with, I'm just a firefighter. But I mean, once they've got it all figured out at the actual uh, public television station, the the setup's really not much more than apparently an app of uh, or a computer program, you know, installing it, uh, setting it up with uh, with Spectre Rep, and you're good to go. I mean, we we put together two or three different tablets in a matter of, you know, 30 minutes or so, and uh, we were up and running. So it's not real tough to put it together. Uh, our biggest our biggest challenge in Houston is. The sheer size, we have over 4,000 firefighters on four different shifts, 93 different fire stations over, you know, 600 square miles. So our biggest challenge is not from the equipment, but from the training aspect and getting, you know, the end user buy-in uh, and getting them kind of up and running. But, again, with the app, uh, the ability to stream the cell phone video and things like that, it's it's not a real complicated class. Uh, push the red button and you're you're streaming, and push the red button and you're not. I mean, it's pretty simple and easy. Uh, there's a little bit more to it to work from the dashboard side of things from our emergency operations center, uh, but it's it's nothing that uh, any ten year old couldn't operate in you know a matter of five minutes. Great, Chief Cook. Thank you, uh, Sheriff Rickwick. Uh, any any thoughts? from your area on ease of using the system? No, I, I completely agree. Um, it, it was very easy. Um, it didn't take a whole lot of training for the uh, end user. Um, I think the hardest part that we had was just getting devices and or not getting the devices for the, for the receiving of it, but getting the officer's devices, their laptops, and getting the, uh, the uh, software installed in them and making sure that they, they were working correctly and everything. Um, because all those devices have security built into them, and uh, they can't load any software on them. So we, we had to have them deliver them to us so that we could install the software into them. That, that was the hardest part. Um, beyond that, it was plug and play, and, and it was pretty intuitive for them. You know, they, they figured it out very quickly how to uh, get that signal and how to view stuff and how to use it. Uh, and it really, there wasn't anything that they could do to to damage the receiving end of that. You know, was, they were receiving a signal, and, you know, if they make a mistake on something, they were not affecting anyone but themselves. Great. Sure, thank you so much. Um, uh, Lana, if I could uh, direct a question to you. We've had several more uh, roll in here by email. Um, does, uh, for data casting uh, to be implemented, does it require a, a public safety partner, or, or can a hospital or a, a, a a region of hospitals come together and look at implementing this uh, from a critical infrastructure perspective? Uh, that's a great question. And, um, and no, it doesn't require a public safety partner. Um, we're very focused on public safety, but uh, in fact, you know, Pat Butler mentioned one of our pillars is education. Our stations do a lot of data casting for schools. And that includes teacher training. It includes um, lesson plans for teachers, including video and other materials that can be downloaded overnight. The teacher has all that ready for the class the next day. Um, so we have a lot of applications that we use this technology for. And, and to your specific question, it certainly could be used, you know, with power plants, with hospitals, um, you know, any vital systems that need to stay on board. One of the most interesting things, I've learned so much uh, about early earthquake warning and, and earthquakes in our work with the California um, Governor's Office of Emergency Services, but one of the main goals of this initial pilot is to get the receive equipment around, uh, for example, all of the firehouses. So when you have those first tremors, the very first initial shaking that people can't detect before the actual bad, really bad part starts, and I'm sorry I don't have the technical terms in front of me, but um, 
but all the firehouse doors, they will get that initially in less than three seconds before the rest of the tremors hit. So all of the firehouse doors will open automatically. So they're not jammed and fire trucks can't get out. So, you know, there's so many possibilities of using um, data casting for, um, for, you know, wide uses around very critical infrastructures that we need to protect in emergencies in addition to the one of the most critical ones we're talking about, first responders, but certainly any other infrastructure as well. Uh, and just to add to that, Barry, this is Pat again. Um, video is, is the most uh, uh, formidable drain on on on, on spectrum, and and, if, and and we do that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all, all year long, and and anything south of that. Is just easier for us to do, whether it's uh, it's voice or data uh, to transmission or graphic transmission, and so forth. And so this, this is this is a an extraordinarily robust system that we can use for all the purposes that we've been talking about this afternoon. Uh, and it's uh, and it and it's hardwired and it, and it's reinforced and it has a full time engineering staff dedicated to uh, to its reliability. And uh, so hospitals, schools, power plants. Uh, and anybody can take advantage of this uh, of this technology. Great, Panelana, thank you so much. I, as you've been speaking, I was also thinking that uh, when I was at Orange County Fire, we had a uh, an unfortunate cyber intrusion into our countywide network that that uh, took out large parts of our network, and other parts of our network were disconnected for their own safety. And and the resolution to that was that the IT department had to. Uh, generate thumb drives and uh, with, with a solution, a patch, and run that around to all the agencies and all the buildings uh, to have yeah. that fixed. And I was thinking, you know, d data casting could easily push out that type of data file that would let an agency yeah. uh, start the recovery process. So just another You're thought right. there. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, I realize we are at the, uh, the e end of our time today. Several other of you have submitted questions online, and we are going to uh, for those questions to the different panel members, and so you will be receiving an answer back from that. Uh, on behalf of the National Public Safety Telecommunications Council, I want to thank everybody for participating uh, with our town hall session today. We appreciate you giving us about 90 minutes of your day to come learn more about this fascinating technology. Uh, and with that, uh, I'd just like to thank uh, all of our presenters for spending the time with us today, and uh, thank you for joining us. Have a great rest of your afternoon.